Welcome to the episode of Making It Make Sense, a podcast that explores problematic topics in America. Together, we will crack open pop culture and demystify communication. Respectfully, of course. We're your hosts, Tequila Mockingbird and Mr. Beautiful, but you can call us T and Mr. B. Welcome back for a special episode of Making It Make Sense. I'm your host, Tequila Mockingbird, and I have a special guest with me here today. My name is Raymond Brown. How are you guys doing? Um, Today we're doing a special episode that is a project for me for school, and we are going to be doing our usual uh, demystifying communication between people representing a multitude of perspectives, respectfully, of course. But today we're going to be talking specifically about an area of concentration for me, which is social media um, and misinformation, disinformation, and education. This assignment seeks to provide some, never all, answers to the question, how does social media disrupt traditional concepts of truth for learners and what can we do about it? We explored ideas behind the public acceptance of truth and what we as truth seekers or truth purveyors can do about it. Misinformation and disinformation is everywhere and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. So what can we do to safeguard ourselves against false narratives in the news and best communicate with people whose perspectives on topics differ from ours? With the rise in use of social media as a news source, we see that the landscape shows rapid dissemination of information. However, with this interconnectedness of information and communication, we find that mixed together seamlessly with many sources of information is a lot of disinformation. How does this relate to equity, that is, for adults? Those with lower income and education levels are most susceptible to believe fake news. They consume in media. Many individuals already subscribe to ideas like, if I didn't witness it, it's not real, paired with people who classify as, who I classify as YouTube scholars, people who see a real once on a topic and commit that to memory as the belief that they now know as much as any well-researched expert. We already know social media is becoming increasingly popular for people to socialize and learn together. Poverty and low levels of education are symptoms of believing the news seen on media. We also know from social capital theory that all traditional, that traditional norms of information vetting do not apply to social media influencers as a rule. All of this leads us to investigate and answer the inquiry question in this assignment. How does social media disrupt traditional concept of truth, traditional concepts of truth for learners, and what can we do about it? So let's kick it off. Are we concerned about misinformation and disinformation in social media? I believe that we should be. Are, are you concerned? I, I I'm am. Definitely, you should be. <laughs> we, as the two people sitting here at this table, yeah. what what are your concerns? I just think that. It's everybody thinks that they're a newscaster nowadays. Right. Number one. Number two is are people actually putting in the effort to actually learn something, to actually know something instead of it just right. being, oh, thank you for telling me that. Like a lot of stuff I hear is I'm like, oh, well, that's an interesting take. I say most of the time it's for the children, but I look at it as a family unit because for the sake of. You never know what type of information they're gonna give. They're gonna say one day, and it's gonna affect everybody right. at the same exactly. time. Right, exactly. At the like, same time. Like as a parent, I feel like my kids will like pop up with some random, seemingly random bit of like pop culture trivia, or even something that I know is false pop culture trivia. Mm. And I'm like, where did you even? How are? It, how is this permeating into your world? Mm. I worry a lot about our children's abilities. Um, based on a lot of the research and information that I read, I'm worried about our adults' abilities too. Do you think people, all people have the same ideas of truth? No, definitely not. Like, what do you think 
are the main factors of that? They base their truths off of, like a, a lot of people, well I say some people can take their, ba their truths off of a lot of people saying one thing. Mm -hmm. And then you have those other truths here is that base it off of fact and information that was provided to them or they were sort of Right, out I them. mean, there's like community truths mm. where she's those a witch. things are... <laughs> she's a witch. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that. I guess I'm also thinking more along the lines of like, don't trust the doctors, don't, don't yeah. like give anyone your name or like, is America as a melting pot, you think, more vulnerable to these kinds of divides because there are so many different cultures here and every culture experiences um, their history or their truth? Mm. Everybody's living in their truth, but it looks different for some people than it does for others. I always feel like when it comes to when it comes to doorstep theory, once it's at the doorstep, it's gone. Like you know what I mean? Once you walk out of that door, it's gone. Whatever your beliefs, whatever your truths, you gotta start over again. I mean like that's a more like evolved perspective mm. on things because I'm just I'm not finding that people on the block or people down the street or in the neighborhood or like wherever you are in a smaller community that are thinking that way. Think about this, and this, this is what I mean by it. When a, a child in an urban environment is around their mom and their mom's like, don't do this, don't do that. Yep, mom, got you. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing they're doing as soon as they walk past that doorstep? Right. That's what I mean. It goes away immediately. It Everything, does. all your values. I mean, I think, that, your... that's, I think that's sort of true but I don't think in practice it is because take something like a school where there's a certain decorum mm. whatever you're supposed to uphold and some of that is like anti-black culture it just yeah. is like but what you wear in school is not the same it's thing not just wear. wearing in school yeah. is like how you talk to this person or how yeah. you like what you're supposed to do in in a power or authority type situation mm. or even what the authority represents to a black family versus a white family hmm. in any public system. Hmm. I feel like all of those things kind of contribute to what is true because if if I'm a white child in a white neighborhood, went to a good white, mostly white public school, I believe that those people are good and they're helping me with my education. But if I'm going in New York City public schools to like neighborhood high school around the corner from the projects I live in, like that situation is going to be um, a little different of how I perceive authority figures because the authority figures that are probably white are going to be police and teachers mm. and the people who run the school. Mm. And that's not necessarily like a positive correlation. So mm. like both, all these truths can exist in the same reality. How do we as one America make peace with multiple truths in the same realities? And where do we, where do we draw the line? Who gets to be the decider of what's true and real? Mm. I looked at a lot of quantitative data. It was really helpful in like understanding where all these demographics fall, but it doesn't answer the questions of like, what do people think? I feel like the line should be drawn at when people are doing their research to get input knowledge for a certain subject matter, that there should be a line drawn where you can't consider yourself something. That has to be like, you're just reading this like, hey, this is a book of facts that's my uncle wrote when he was 17 years old, I'm gonna mm -hmm. base my whole life off of this 17, this right. book right here. And I know way more just because of what's in this book. They can't, can't do that. Should, there should be a line, you know what I mean? In um, my research, a lot of the recommendations um, were for uh, media literacy education, like starting young mm. for our children mm. so that they can safely navigate all of this information. And for there to be better fact check fact checking sources yes. that's another one however i wonder though we are at a 
period of such mistrust in everything. And like the data shows that like 39% of black people in, in the United States just don't trust anything yeah. is what I saw, which, you know, I'm not going to debate. That's completely valid, obviously. Like that's not the question, Tweet but the question all, right? is, what do we do from here when we as a white privileged society have othered a whole community so much that now that now there's just reactive like like the Hebrews to Negroes movie and there's just the Kanye and the Kyrie there's just a lot of backlash to white authority how do we like recognize that while try and restore faith in um credible news media institutions in my opinion i it's a weird opinion but if we can trace back our history of knowledge to the beginning of where things started going off wrong mm -hmm. i feel like if we can be honest with those situations and come about that's where we could start because I feel like a lot like, of people are like, like for example. Are you speaking specifically to black history? Oh yeah, I'll speak, yeah, when it comes to black, black history, American yeah, history. black American history and where it stopped mm -hmm. and where we don't know anything. And then the stories that we hear and then the history that we find out from the stories that we hear that are true stories that we find out that they actually work together. We hear it. So that's interesting because that speaks to another prescription, mm. which is education policy or education policy around like yeah. implementing curriculum yeah. for media literacy but speaking to that for one for adults is it too late to get people to, like gaining people's trust back after it's been lost you just can't stack the lies is, on top of each other right so i'm wondering if you start with schools if like black families are seeing their stories included in what kids are bringing home from school this will inspire more trust and hey what is the school teaching oh then maybe the school can be more of a community advocate and sharing with families now that there's better relationships like i feel like all of these things have to work in tandem with each other quick but... quick adding on that what you just said what else does that do if the kid is bringing home work that has stories about people like their family. What else is it doing? It's connecting those families even more. It's like right. separating those families, which right. is actually building an actual community. You're never going to implicitly trust anything that is a stranger to Facts. you. Facts, yeah. And I think that that's pretty universal amongst cultures. It's just not all cultures have to exist in that reality yeah. all the time. I think that speaks to one of um, the, the course materials um, from the class this year about successful curriculum, um, including identities, till people who are participating in the learning feel like their identities are represented somewhere or inter interplaying with what they're doing and that it matters, mm. you're not going to have full buy-in. Dr. Goldie Mohammed um, talked about the, the identities and the joy, too. And we know that clickbait is always going to sell more whatever's that this capitalist new system is doing how do we inspire more pervasive stories uh, that like shift like if i turn on the news and every time i turn it on another black person is being shown being maimed by somebody why am i watching that news yeah what's the point so like, is there a way we can report on it without it being so like visceral it's just messed up how they subject us to certain channels and you have to have certain subscriptions in order to be able to watch right news of the right. stature that is, that's a really good point that i don't i hadn't considered yet is that what news is free and what news do you have is behind a paywall what information is free and what information is behind a paywall right. as well exactly that's a really good point because i've noticed do just in internet wise throughout the times let's just break it down to just the gaming mm -hmm. on on the phone some of the games that you first learn about are like wow this is like playing video games on a tv mm -hmm. but what happened was it was a switch 
where all these games started getting super arcadish and not something you normally get used to. Right. And you're and now the whole menu of right. games is and you like know that. What gets my young children is they want an app. Mommy, can I have this app? It's free. Yeah. I look at it and the first thing I see is Absolutely. in app purchases. That so that means two things. One, to play it for free, there's ads. And two, all the good stuff they're going to want to do costs money. And, and there's no age them. range on the ads. Right. There's age range for the game, but not the ads. Correct. And I honestly feel like most of the craziness that mm. my kids have encountered has been from free, age appropriate via app app games. Via, say, we're going to have to say it. What? Via, because. Android. Oh, you're telling me you're trying to get me shut down. It. So, um, what what role does the algorithm play though in the in media discourse and and learning and how can this mm. be problematic? Yeah. Uh, like the basis for this podcast comes a uh, theorist leader that said um, one comes to embrace perspectives that run counter to one's own to see truth as relative or to see knowledge that is most worth teaching and learning as fluid. Like that's a goal, right? So to break that down, like wanting to hear from people mm. that have perspectives differing from your own, um, seeing truth as relative, what we just talked about as like authority in schools may not, my truth may not be the same as yours. Um, and to see the, the knowledge that's worth teaching and learning is fluid, which means like there's not a set collection of things that the same people need to know every year all the time. Mm. Like we have to understand that like curriculum needs to be constantly looked at for relevance because there's only so much time that you have in traditional methods of schooling the child and there's so much of it is wasted. Mm -hmm. Um, so given that and the algorithm, those two ideas feel like they're really counter to each other because what does the algorithm do for you? Just floods, floods me with stuff from my friends more than my stuff, like more than what I enjoy. It gives me otters. Otters. <laughs> It gives me honor yeah. too, but like, I feel like it all, what it, it all started with bearded dragons and I really liked those. And then it gave me raccoons and I really liked those. And then it gave me possums and I liked those. And I got to otters. Um, I think I have a lot of pandas like recently, but I'm not mad at it. Like I find that my algorithm is really efficient. I'm, we're talking Instagram specifically. Um, really efficient at knowing exactly what I want to see, like to hear, um, which is like a concept that basically confirmation bias, where you're in an echo chamber, mm. that everything you see will confirm things that you already believe. So that contributes to your feelings of justness and righteousness in your, I know this to be true, not, not you, but like one. Mm. So like, what do we, how does the algorithm counter to this idea from Sleater of trying to be embracing all of these yeah. things in order to actually learn? Well, that's what happened with my algorithm. It didn't, at first, it took years. It's been, it's taken a while for it to actually catch on to my interest because I refused to do, I used to refuse to do things on my phone. Mm -hmm. Specifically, like, without putting it in, brow, like, private browser mode or mm -hmm. doing certain things like that because, or saying no to everything. I don't allow any cookies, none of this stuff. Because... I wanted to see what's the difference. And what the difference was, they don't let you see, well, you don't you don't see as much. So you were able to successfully like have a whole thing without cookies because I've been I've been thinking about that a lot recently. Always say like, no. I always say yes. Yeah, I'm all set. I like to see I think it's what too they late don't, for me. I like to see what they like when I first sign up for something, I don't want you to be the person to control what I see because I want to be able to bring in the people. But like, as these things become more advanced, yeah. it's going to be like... But I'd rather have my friends first. Yeah, but I'm saying to... it's friends first. Then, yeah. then the entertainment yeah, What's his stuff. name? Kevin Samuels. Mm. Like... Rest in peace. 
Rest. Okay. Rest in wherever. He's sleeping. Rest Somewhere. wherever you are. I yeah, hope you're resting. You are. Yeah, rest, yeah, wherever you are. You don't um, have to worry about that, that stuff. It became to a point where he became. He his strategy really was I I like believe now I I don't even know where I heard this but like he ta- like what we're talking about he emulated the echo chamber mm. and gained popularity for giving mm. people back what they want to hear to a level so this is social capital theory now he has all this social capital he's influential mm. now anything he says is perceived as fact so now he can just say oh, whatever man. he wants and this is this is concerning to me and then like people if i'm watching him and i'm liking his stuff people who are saying the same things as him are going to be coming into I my feed which is going to be building their social capital mm-hmm. um so i was hoping that his direction wasn't that and what it was is him trying to come off as a expert or a guru instead of people him spitting facts that's what i was right. banking i was be- that's what i'm banking on but from what you're saying and the way you put that it was like wow that'd be me- that's messed up but i think that's real yeah. i think that is what's like we are um having so much trouble trying to figure out yeah, what's pers- to like but also in trying to figure out what's real and what's fake we're mm. also learning that Look at the metaverse. Perceived reality is reality now. Yeah. Like to a certain degree, there's real money attached to it, and there's like real, mm-hmm. like it, the social interactions, they're yeah. real. Like somebody else is like a real human is well, behind the be, other yeah, side. That could be a different perspective um, on different parts of truth. But, but like, like at what point in social capital theory does perceived power and influence like Trump? actual that's the knowledge part. that's terrifying i'm worried that we're already there i don't think so 100 percent. i think we're partially I there mean, because there's a lot of people Tate, like, yeah but he's not a, but i'm saying but he's so popular but he's not a representation of man to me i thank you thank you you understand what i'm yes, saying right I do. and you realize that there's a lot of people that have mothers in the world that don't think like that and the, there's people that have mothers right. that think like that. So that's why those people had access. I, I, like I, I talk about a lot. A lot of people weigh, weigh, on, weigh in on what they, based off of how many opportunities mm-hmm. and options they have. So I feel like people that follow that guy are basing their whole lifestyles off how many options and opportunities they had in comparison to others. Right, also because people are watching influencers post their perceived power and influence. That part. And whether it's true or not, not seeing the work that it took to get... Like, there's so much, like, like I'm faking being successful at this, yeah. and you're going to then envy my success. Correct without knowing what kind of work goes into the even not success. Yeah. Like how many times did I fail before I succeeded? Like I'm not posting that. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's giving a warped perception of like what works in this metaverse yeah. as opposed to what works, you know, still we're, we're living in limbo in yeah. between. And that, like this will probably be looked at as like the in-between phase yeah. between yeah. like digital life and real life which is wild because i feel like people rather a digital obituary than an actual obituary yes. when they die, which is fucked yes that's fucked yeah, you can you can yeah, that's, okay. yeah that's fucked you know what i mean I look, yeah that's the perspective I, i've always looked at it like people really don't care about what their obituary is going to look like all they care about is this digital obituary mm-hmm. that, that nobody's going to pay attention to once you hit a certain age because they say once you hit a certain age you're not supposed to be messing with this mm-hmm. you know what i mean that's interesting mm. um where do we see white privilege in social media discourse and learning? Just because we only have a few minutes left, I thought I'd pick an easy Where do we topic. see it? Yeah, and how and why do you think this makes people uncomfortable? I'm gonna go with a, like an Instagram live debate type situation, oh. like because that's where I do a lot of oh. my um, education work um, was through these live formats and things can go left. Like I tend to keep them pretty like contained in my lives. But like, you know, I'll swipe into lives all the time where people are 
if you're listening to people, I mean, not even just white privilege, but I would say like gender privilege too, and like other types of privileges are coming into play with this layer of truth, right? Because my truth is that I went through the world with white privilege and like, you know, all these systems were nice to me. Um, that's true. Um, that doesn't make your truth not true, but I find that a lot of the problem is when people won't recognize that with each other. They won't ever see it. They don't want to see it. And that's the, that's a big issue that I notice when it comes to people. They don't try to see, like, they don't really, when it comes to black or white, yeah, we're black or white. And they try to pass it on like that. No, you can't just do that. You mm -hmm. got to acknowledge, then move on. Acknowledgement right. is number one. Absolutely. I actually... Thank you for that. That feels really validating for yeah, me because that's what I just wrote in this paper was yeah, that has to be a uniform acceptance of the existence of white privilege. Um, I would push that there should be universal acceptance of the patriarchy as well. Um, just not even as like, it's bad, it's good. It just, you know, it exists moving yeah. through the world. It as can a, move as on, it, it could be on In other certain side. areas is going to be easier for you while recognizing that that's not true in all areas. And then that there are other categories, race, geographic location, um, age, all this other stuff that will play into mm. that obviously. But um, universal acceptance has to happen. Um, we just have to stop arguing about that yeah, and it allowing to it to like seep into your opinions about other things. The phrase, it happened, should go a long way. It happened. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever So do you have any um, advice for us about the white privilege um, conversation? Like, like have you ever successfully been able to get someone to be like, oh, I didn't realize I was using white privilege? Or is it that something that someone will come to after a series of experiences? Like, I think they should just be able to. Yeah, I, I don't think there should be a person in the world that should tell somebody else you're utilizing white privilege. Or let that they have to have self-acknowledgement. They have to have acknowledgement of it. But you can't. Which circles back to it being part of our children's yeah, curriculum. That's why we So yeah. that people aren't like, it's hard when you learn the world is one way through your entire schooling and then you become adult, an adult and you're like, holy shit, there was so much that nobody ever prepared me for that like a whole lot of like logarithmic equations is not going to help me with here. Yeah. Um, like a fact of... So, some some white people don't like well let's just put it like this how about you watch tv in the 90s and then you go to the suburbs you only think white people live in the suburbs like you know what i mean if you only watch like right. black shows right that's like you know like, what i mean that's like, like when i taught in new york city public schools in high school and they thought they all thought when they got to high school it was going to be like saved by the bell and like it, they were just obsessed. They wanted lockers. Yeah. They were like, there just weren't any. Like, then I, yeah, and then I moved to Virginia, and then I lived in the suburbs, and it was a black neighborhood, suburbs. Mm. It was a whole suburb, like, everywhere you go. So I was like, oh, okay. All right, it's happened before. Right. <laughs> so one, one scholar that um, we work with in my department a lot is uh, called Frere. And um, one of these questions comes from Frere. He wrote to... Um, really important works that we study a lot called the pedagogy of the oppressed and the pedagogy of hope and um, one of the things that he said um, was about common sense like is common sense actually common or do we have to work on that as a society work on it. I feel like we got to work on it I feel like we have such a spectrum of like Perception. economic factors um, education levels that like and, and languages and cultures that like, if there's something that we as America, Americans think should be common sense for our people, we need to make sure that like, we're finding ways within communities and institutions to make sure that people know this stuff. Mm -hmm. And how cultural is common sense? Like Experience. But it's also very cultural. Like, have you ever been in a Dominican house? If anything's wrong with you, it's like Vicks. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know if it works or not. It Sometimes yeah. it does, but like, it's, it's cultural. 
um, about common sense or like how people from warmer weather places um, really dress their babies like really, really warm. Um, even when like me as a New Englander, like we go outside in the winter in t-shirts sometimes and like it horrified my mother-in-law mm. when she was, you know, like it's 60 degrees. We're in like a full, mm -hmm. like, you know, a full baby suit. I feel like common sense comes with, I, I don't want to be like the person to say it, but I feel like it comes with depends, depending on your financial demographic or where you stay. Right. That's what I'm saying. Or education level. Because I had a manager, what, four years ago tell, tell me, oh man, I wish I didn't, I wish I didn't go to college at this time since I'm working in cannabis mm -hmm. and I wish I just would have did this instead of accounting because I don't, I don't understand half this stuff right. and they gave me this position and I'm like, bro, so you're telling me I'm standing across from somebody that I know more information about, but you're mm -hmm. automatically going to get paid more than me because you went to college. Even yeah. You didn't even go to college for this. And the crazy thing is like that doesn't even guarantee to work anymore no. because like now more and more college graduates have to work for free yeah. um, before they even get into the workforce, which like is a whole, I could, I could go on. Mm -hmm. um, that part. About that. <laughs> People who write standardized exams often use this culturally perceived white aspect of common Stereotypical. Sense, right? And then, <laughs> I mean, I can remember a very specific example of my first year as a teacher um, the Regents exam for sixth grade had some type of, I can't, I can't remember what the question was, but it was some type of question where um, it referenced a very suburban or country something, mm -hmm. like some type of plant or like something. And like, n it was totally culturally biased. None of the students in New York City I had no idea, no clue what it was. And we weren't allowed to tell them. And like, no doubt, that was my first year teaching. No doubt, this is like everywhere. How about cul de sac, that's the first thing. When you see that on a piece of paper, you don't know what a cul de sac is. Oh, there's right. No, there's no cul de sacs in the it's city. A, that, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly my point. And so, that's what I'm saying is like, if we are deeming certain things common sense, like, who's who's sense? Because, like, if you ask a white family this list of like all these things that the black families do, or some black families do, obviously mm. not everyone. They might say like that that doesn't seem like common sense. Lazy like, Susan. Another not common sense thing in the world. Right? <laughs> or like or like why do you do it that way? Or like it's you know, it just doesn't make sense when you're coming into a new culture, but that means that the established culture, the dominant culture, mm. is making up what common sense is. Mm -hmm. And that is problematic, I think. Mm -hmm. Also. Like it's common sense to go into a bodega in New York to see the cat sitting on the bread. Right. That's, it's, it's, that's the manager. That's the manager. He's going to be there. Right? <laughs> well, we've come to the end of our time here. Mm. This was actually really fun. You gave me some really interesting ideas, um, things I hadn't thought of. Uh, so I so appreciate your perspective and your participation. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And... Um, Good luck in this world. <laughs> Stay woke out there. Stay woke, y'all. <laughs> All right, so this is our first. All right, so this is our first.